Okay. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I hope everybody had a good lunch and had a good uh, break. So, uh, let me introduce myself a little bit. My name is uh, Xiu Huang. Uh, I'm a performance engineer from the from the performance team, uh, the infrastructure group for ARM. Uh, so at ARM, I'm working mainly working on performance analysis on Post and uh, Pre Silicon for the uh, ARM server cores, which is a uh, new verse, if you have heard it. Uh, so before that, I, uh, I was doing my PhD from Texas A&M and working on program verification, especially for uh, concurrency. And uh, there, are, yeah, there are two other names uh, listed here. They are my colleagues, Alokik and uh, Maloch. Alokik is a, uh, is a director for the 5G solutions at the performance team. So if you are interested in building the 5G stacks uh, based on ARM platforms, so he's, he's a good candidate to, uh, to reach out. And Malaji is my manager, and he who is responsible for the, uh, for the software development at the performance team. Uh, so in this talk, uh, there will be uh, less technology comparing to the earlier session in the morning. So I will mainly showing the performance data on, the, uh, on our ARM server cores, which is Ampere. And also show, uh, I will present a uh, showcase uh, showing how we, uh, how we find out the root cause of a large latency when we uh, test the cyclic test on the Ampere cores. All right. So here's the agenda. Yeah, I will first talk about the background and uh, the motivation for this work. So why the real-time kernel is needed on ARM. And then I will show some uh, latency data on the Ampere uh, outro course. And then I will show you uh, the, the issue we got, uh, the large latency we observed during our test and how we uh, use the trace CMD to uh, find out the root cause. Because I didn't know the the real-time analysis tool before. Yeah, and thanks for the introduction. So I got some knowledge. Okay, uh, so here's the background of so why we did this work and why so the RT latency matters form. So the short answer is uh, our customers ask about this. Uh, we have like got a lot of requests from our partners and basically the group, the infrastructure performance team uh, is mainly driven by the requests from the uh, for our partners like Google, Amazon, Microsoft, and those uh, those big you know cloud players. Uh, so ARM is getting more uh, and more attention in the five G space, uh, especially in the past few years. So the left picture shows the uh, shows a uh, a five G demo based on uh, ARM platforms, uh, which is on the uh, which was presented at the, the uh, MWC, uh, the past WMC this year, the uh, Mobile World Conference. So we have actually, we, we are reached out by a lot of partners like uh, NVIDIA and Microsoft and Wind River to ask about the, uh, the latency issues on the ARM cores. Even though that they're running their own kernels or operating systems like Wind River, they run uh, the Starlinks. And for Microsoft, it runs the uh, Mariner. But uh, even that, they, the, the root cause for the high latency should be similar. We share our tuning options, and some of them uh, work, work for them very well. So that's the, basically the modification for why. So the team is investing time on this. Uh, hope this is big enough for, for you to read. Yes. this. Uh, this slide shows some uh, latency requirements for the 5G applications, which is, uh, the slide is from my colleague, and it's basically from the, from the link here. It is some like a uh, specification or standards for the uh, 5G applications. So here are some like uh, the latency requirements. They have very strict re, uh, latency requirements. For example, for the AR, VR applications, the, the End-to-end -end latency should not be over 10 microseconds, and for some cloud gaming, should be like uh, under seven microseconds, and so on. For en energy, power grade, uh, yeah, some other applications. So the 
the the end to end is just the, the from one endpoint device. Uh, the latency for end to end is from one end device to another end device via some uh, radio access network. So there's something called the the ORAN. Um, but I I'm not an expert on 5G. So my job is just uh, you know tuning the kernel and to make the latency as low as possible. So it's basically for some marketing uh, purpose. Um, so this slide is all some background information, and uh, uh, this defines how they, uh, how does the slide uh, compute the end-to-end -end latency. It's basically like for, for example, for an end-to-end latency based on the OSI seven-layer model, it is from the one endpoint to another endpoint. So here is like T7 minus T1, so this is end-to-end uh, latency they define uh, for two devices. And this is the latency like uh, you got on the network traffic. Uh, you have to go through those layers and to reach uh, via the radio uh, station and then get to another device. But you also have some, uh, you, you could also get some delay from the, uh, from the execution of your application on the, in the operating system. So here's why like uh, the RT uh, real-time kernel uh, matters form. So there are some uh, benefits, like for the real-time kernel. So it gives you a uh, guarantee. It, it, guarantees, uh, it gives you a guarantee on how long that the application will wait in the uh, for the CPU. And uh, uh, in summary, there are three benefits from the uh, real-time kernel. One is like it can uh, make your execution quicker, and it gives you a faster response time. And more importantly, for the uh, for these five G uh, applications, the, they they have very st strict requirement on the uh, URLC, so it's called the ultra uh, ultra reliable low latency communication. So it has some reliability uh, requirements. Yeah. Okay. I think I just uh, talked too much about the yeah. This some very obvious uh, modifications. I think uh, you, you guys are experts, you know much more about the real time kernel than me. And okay, so that's the yeah. Next, I will show you the uh, some the latency data on uh, on our ARM cores, and uh, here's the uh, the the OS information, the hardware information. We I just in, we installed the uh, real time kernel from Ubuntu, uh, so the kernel is uh, version is five point fifteen, and we didn't build and or uh, make any changes to the kernel. Just uh, uh, use. Uh, what we uh, installed from this link. And for the hardware, uh, we, so our job is mainly uh, folks on ARM cores, but uh, here I also list a uh, Intel core uh, for, for a comparison, but I didn't show, we didn't do any tunings for the Intel platform. We just show you, when you see the data on Intel, it's just the, some uh, out of the box settings. So for the ARM cores, uh, we use the, the Ampere Ultra, which has 80 uh, physics cores. And uh, if you, yeah, if you do some tests before on this, so this is one is uh, new version N1 based. Uh, it's very, it's our uh, very uh, beginning new uh, product. Now we have N N2, V1, and V2, which are more powerful cores. But here you may ask why we didn't try any other uh, server cores. Uh, so, Again, this is not what I decided because the currently the partners are building 5G solutions on the Ampere course, which is N1. And for Intel, uh, in comparison, we tested on the Cascade Lake, uh, so which has 24 physics cores, and each core has two uh, uh, simultaneous threads. So in total, it has 48 virtual threads. So the Cascade Lake is the second uh, Zion generation of uh, Intel server cores. And for the cyclic test, this is the benchmark we use to measure the latency. So it's the version is v point, uh, v2.20. Uh, okay, I, yeah, I, maybe I just skip this because uh, the, the introduction to uh, cyclic test has been uh, talked about many times in the morning. Uh, but I, I just quickly go through. So uh, this, w w yeah, cyclic test is a benchmark that I use to measure the latency. So what, what exactly it measures is uh, it measures the difference between uh, you make a thread to sleep and uh, you measure the, 
the intended wake up time and uh, the time at which it actually is uh, woken up. So this code is the, the, the measure logic for this, uh, for this benchmark. And on the right side, it shows a uh, diagram uh, how uh, to make it uh, more clear to understand how it works. So you have a, your, your, your task with RD thread, and uh, you make it go to th sleep, and uh, then you wake it up, and then you uh, schedule back. So the latency mainly uh, comes from uh, two sides. Uh, one is the, uh, for the in latency on the interrupt, and uh, uh, the second part is the latency on the, on the schedule. So at the end, you just calculate the difference between the, yeah, so you use the n minus start and minus 200 microseconds. So I think, yeah, I think everybody's clear about how, uh, what a cyclic test is and how it works. Uh, these are the options, the testing options we, uh, we used for uh, running cyclic test. So it's, it's very standard. I just got this uh, command line from the documentation of cyclic test. So the priority, we set it as 90 and an interval for uh, 200 microseconds. And for the loop iterations, uh, it's 100 million. So in total, the execution runs about uh, six hours. Uh, suggested by the documentation of cyclic test, uh, it, should be, it should be run a little bit longer for uh, real-time testing, uh, I think. It's, for some reliability guarantees. Uh, so we, for here, I just show you the, how we run, run it on a uh, 64 cores, but we have tried some different core counts. Uh, later, I will show you the data. And so, yeah, everything is here is very uh, straightforward, and except the last one is the, you, 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 can, uh, you can bind the, uh, the main thread on a specific core. Uh, that's for, for newer versions, I found there's no issues for, for older version of cyclic test. If you, if you uh, use a newer version, you didn't, you didn't set the, uh, the main thread, you will find that there's one core has a obvious higher latency than other cores because that it runs the main thread on that core. So you, for newer versions, I, I, it, it's better to set this uh, main thread on a, uh, on a gatekeeper. Okay, uh, these are the options that we, okay, here's the, uh, the histogram. We collected on, on the ARM cores and uh, the Intel Cascade Lake. Uh, so on the two pic, for the two pictures on the left side, they are the latency data uh, for 80 cores and 24 cores on MPA l respectively. Uh, so the, the, the y-axis is the number of uh, samples, so in total it's 100 million, and the x-axis is the, uh, the, the latency in microseconds. So you can see that uh, it has a long latency at the training uh, of the histogram, and there's one purple line that is where it uh, has a higher latency uh, than the other cores. I'll show you uh, why this happens and how we, how we fix this. Uh, yes. Uh, quick question. Did you have any load on the machines while testing no. or was it oh, idle? Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, maybe I should make it clear. So in this talk, I didn't show any data uh, with uh, CPU, uh, CPU load uh, or CPU stressed. It's just the, uh, uh, si the system is idle and run the cyclic test. We did some tests, so it gets the uh, latency higher, but uh, um, but maybe that, that is a, that is a fair comp that should be a fair comparison with CPU load. But uh, for some marketing purpose, we just need to show okay the the best performance number. So in this talk, uh, there's no CPU load. Yep. Okay, so on the right side, so I think CPU uh, oh sorry Intel did, did a pretty good. Job so the latency the max latency is uh, just thirty one microseconds. So don't be uh, don't get confused by these uh, uh, diagrams here. Even though like the latency on ARM is shows like two over two hundred microseconds, but there are just very few samples that uh, has a high latency. Uh, I would say like for more than ninety eight or ninety nine percent, the latency is just two microseconds. It's just the worst case, but a very few sample like a, a single digit. Yes. Um, 
you mentioned Intel did a very good job. Are you sure that this is a CPU issue, not a Linux issue? It, I, think. Uh, I don't think this is a uh, uh, hardware issue. It's more like because uh, according to uh, my uh, my experiments, I will show later. So we we apply tuning options and we can catch up the performance of uh, on Intel. So yeah. just that it, statement, it, Intel did a good job. Quote my um, yeah. Okay, uh, did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't want to advertise for Intel here because I'm from ARM, so don't get me wrong. I just <laughs> yeah, I'm, I mean, I, I, yeah, I want, really want to show like ARM also like the hardware is uh, powerful enough. I think because it, you know Intel has been developing these server cores for you know dozens of years, they have like uh, did a very good job. I have to admit that they they really did a good job on software optimization optimization on the kernel and the software. So that's we have to face it. Yeah, I just won't be fair. Okay, so this is some uh, initial like uh, uh, bug reports we submitted to uh, Ubuntu. Uh, so these are some relatively easier to uh, to find out. So once is the uh, the RCU stores, we we find this issue when we uh, run the cyclic test with uh, on on two sockets of the uh, MPM machine, but on a single socket, it, it, there's no such issues, and they fix that issue, and. Uh, the purple line that I mentioned earlier, uh, the, there's one core that always higher, uh, suffer from higher latency than other cores is caused by the uh, CPPC FIE issue. Uh, so this one has already uh, uh, fixed in the kernel. So the FIE issue, it makes the, gives some extra overhead from 2% to 10% on the CPU, even the system is, is idle. So the FIE is related to something like a, a uh, fre uh, frequency scanning uh, uh, feature. Um, one thing, is this upstream or is it um, out of tree Ubuntu thingy? I don't think this is upstream. We just re uh, wait. Oh, I think yes. So there's a two links here. So uh, the one link was to the uh, bug report to uh, Ubuntu, and uh, the the other link was a uh, with patch submitted uh, by our kernel engineer, Jeremy Linton. I think he's working on upstream. So he, he already found this issue and uh, uh, maybe he, I, I didn't double check that. I think he, he's, he's already uh, submitted the patch to the upstream. But at FII, but at FII thing you said, it is uh, CPU frequency related, right? Yes. Yeah, so in general the device is not use it at all. Just clock it to the highest frequency and leave it alone supposed to have a workload where you don't need to change the frequency at all because um, if you lower the frequency the core goes idle until the core is stable enough at the lower frequency and if it runs the lower frequency it's lower mm -hmm. so there's like two reasons why will not touch it at all uh, I, I'm, yeah, I'm not very clear about uh, your question so you, my point is um, RT-wise, CPU frequency, mm -hmm. clock it to the highest one mm -hmm. and make sure you yes. don't change anything at all. Yes. Then it's most likely what you did with by disable FII. Yeah. So this is like... It should be... Yeah, exactly. that should be disabled, yes. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, somehow that uh, this, this one just uh, enabled when we're uh, running the uh, RT kernel. So it should be disabled. Yeah, you are right. So when you test the... Uh, the the RT latency, so all the CPU should be run at the highest frequency. Okay, so after we, yeah, it gets more clear the uh, for the uh, histogram. So the latency, the max latency just lowers to like uh, uh, 20 microseconds. But this is still not enough uh, because our target is uh, 10 microseconds for the max latency. And uh, these are the tuning options that we, uh, we added to the kernel. Uh, to improve the latency. Uh, I, th I don't think there's anything special here. All these options are either from the Red Hat, uh, the online documentation. <laughs> yeah, you did a good job, I have to admit. <laughs> and uh, yeah, also some uh, uh, documentation from the uh, Ubuntu and some on other online resources. So yeah, everybody did just, I feel like everybody did the similar things. They, uh, the principle is just uh, disable the time ticker and uh, 
make the R RCU with no callbacks and uh, also isolate the calls. I highlighted here which are the options uh, yes, most helpful for the latency. Just, just editing. Yeah, uh, probably all those things are in the Red Hat documentations, but there is also a tool named the Tunedi, Tundi, that applies those those setups here. It works fine, apart from from that grumpy guy. <laughs> you see, that's the documentation about that. I mean, we actually use Tundi for one of our customers, and it worked really nice. <laughs> so I can't I can't say the customer name. Um, the thing about TuneD is that it does a lot of things in the background. It's not documented what it does, why it does, things it does. And for that reason, I don't like it at all. Like, it does a lot of things in the background. Read the code. <laughs> I'm joking. No, I see Yeah. So... Yeah, there is pretty long verbose documentation, I have to say. <laughs> some of them work, but some uh, just uh, don't work for Ubuntu. Uh, so, yeah, the, the most one, the most uh, useful one I just highlighted, uh, just isolate the cores for running the RT threads and uh, also isolate the, uh, the interrupts. So I just, for, for this test, I only uh, assigned core zero and a core one for the gatekeeper. Uh, you, so this can maybe can fine tuning to find the uh, best combination. But I, for me, I just I increase the number of uh, for more cores for the gatekeeper. Just does not help for the latency. And uh, also, I need to use, uh, emphasize one the yeah the last one. At the at the very beginning, we didn't know this one helps. Uh, is is uh, is. We, we figure this out of, uh, for a later investigation. I will show you later. So I will next show the performance data without this. So we, uh, so with the run, uh, the kernel kernel uh, kernel stack uh, offsite randomization is enabled. So uh, the the results coming later will with this one enabled, and some other options uh, like uh, uh, turns off the throttling and uh, also to move the kernel work queues to, uh, to the gatekeepers and uh, set the uh, CPU uh, 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 performance governor to, uh, to performance to make this course running at the, mo uh, at the highest latency. And the last one is, uh, so this one is from the, the Red Hat documentation. I found this one is, helps a little, uh, just uh, disable the uh, graphics console. And uh, I, I think, yeah, for me, it, it, make, it lowers the max latency like a, one microseconds, I feel. So I just put it there. Yes. Uh, so basically you are running RT tasks um, from core two to core 79. How are you dispatching the RT tasks? Are you dynamically dispatching them or statically allocating? What's your story regarding task uh, dispatching? Because this is a large number of CPUs. They have to be, um, I'm not talking about the parameters. They have uh. to be so he has no uh, load balancing. Yeah. yeah. Move on, please. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 okay. But like the Kubernetes okay. thing, we do. Yeah, if, yeah, I can maybe uh, yeah. answer your questions offline. Okay, so these are the latency data uh, with those tuned options applied uh, on 24 cores, 48 cores, and 64 cores, respectively. And you can see that on 24 cores, it's, it's, it, it, it is very good. The max latency is under 10 microseconds. And when the core counts increase, uh, the max latency increase a little bit. It's over 10, 10 microseconds, 12, microse uh, 12 microseconds, still acceptable. But when it comes to uh, some higher core counts, like 64 cores, the latency is over 100 microseconds. Uh, so this is... Uh, yeah, I think this is just for uh, totally for business, uh, for marketing purpose. Even if you uh, make a very perfect number with the cyclic test, you can now see uh, it perfect. Uh, the the system is perfect with uh, real world applications, but uh, uh, but it is what it is. The goal is to make the max latency under ten microseconds. Um, but you may you may wonder why it's ten microseconds uh, because. We heard from our partners that uh, Intel did so, so we want to catch up with them. 
yeah. So that that's the case. But I didn't see the data. It's just from uh, Rakuten. They are running the uh, Rocky Linux. They're saying, hey, they got the max latency under 10 microseconds. So a lot of come to me, hey, can we do the same? So that's why I we really spent a lot of time on figure out why uh, there's a large latency when it, when it runs on higher core counts. Okay, so that's what I mentioned when uh, the, the prior slide with the data uh, with this uh, randomization, kernel stack randomization enabled. But uh, when we disable this, you can find the max latency goes down uh, even with uh, high core counts. So the, the two diagrams on the bottom are the updated performance data. I'm not sure if the title is big enough for you to read. And uh, so the max latency is under uh, is nine microseconds. And even for 64 cores, it's still like nine microseconds with this uh, kernel, uh, kernel stack uh, randomization uh, disabled. So why, how we fi figure this out? Uh, so I will, I will show you in the uh, in, in next few slides. Uh, so I want to, yeah, see, thanks for the documentation. So yeah, right ahead, you can see here. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, so these are the documentations and the materials that we refer to for the uh, RT tuning. Uh, so uh, for, the, for the rest of the talk, I will, uh, yeah, the, is a showcase slide uh, showing how we figure out the root cause of the large latency on high core counts. And uh, we also, the, our kernel engineer uh, submitted a patch to fix this issue. So, as I mentioned before, when we run the cyclic test with the tune options on high core counts here, 64 cores, there's a, a higher latency at the training, uh, training part of the histogram. So it's definitely uh, over 10 microseconds. The max latency is uh, over 100. And it, this issue is, is I, maybe because it's difficult for me, maybe it's easier for you kernel experts. Um, so it is, I think the most challenging part is it is not like bad as it looks. So when you pull out the raw data of the latency, okay, you can find that. So on the right side, uh, so this is on the core 60. So uh, the first column shows the, the number of samples. So, oh, sorry, the frequencies. Oh, my bad, the latencies from zero to uh, 30 microseconds. And on the right column, it shows the corresponding uh, number of samples. So 99, more than 99% of the samples has just latency of two microseconds. Uh, very few have uh, over uh, 10 microseconds. So this makes it harder for us to capture the, the root cause and also uh, the monitoring tool does not work. Um, so then we have to come to trace as I, what I search uh, online. So yeah, uh, I use the trace CMD to debugging this issue and because I watch a video online uh, by, I think by, yeah, by, Steve, uh, by Steven uh, from the EOSS last year. Uh, you can find, yeah, yeah so I, I also put the link here. So he gave a demo and uh, she's showing how, uh, how to find out the large latency uh, with tracing using the tool trace CMD. Um, so that's what I, uh, I use to debug this issue. If I know earlier than your tool, I probably will try your tool. <laughs> I will next time if I got a similar issue. I, I gave a presentation at the same conference last year. Oh, okay, last year? Yeah. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> you should have You might have a cyclic test skin inside RTLA using timer lat in the background to help with the backward compatibility. But it, once you start using RTLA, you just don't get back. Hope. Yeah. Um, okay, I'll go on. So this is the uh, the the command that I use a wrong uh, trace CMD to uh, to get the trace and decode the trace. So the, the blue part that I highlighted is just the regular uh, command for the cyclic test. 
and uh, just adding the the breaking point for the for the tracing when it reaches the uh, the large agency. Because uh, even though we care only ten microseconds, because when I enable the tracing tool, there there is overhead, so I I just make it to uh, one hundred microseconds. Uh, but I still cannot make it too large, like uh, 150. Otherwise, it will generate uh, uh, more tracing data. It will make it more difficult to decode. Uh, that's why I ask, also ask uh, Daniel uh, uh, in the morning. And uh, uh, I mean, the, the challenge of doing tracing analysis for this kind of problems is to figuring out what to enable. Right, and yes. in this example yeah, here, yeah. it's enabling all functions and yes. all events. Yes. So it's a lot of, it's way more than what you need. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Two minutes, that, that. Two yeah, that's a good point. So if you are. Um, one thing I wanted to add is um, does it record everything? I think so, yeah, because. Because yeah. that's the thing you don't want in usually. Okay. What you want usually is to run the recording in the ring buffer for like an hour. And the ring buffer is only like the playback for the last 100 milliseconds or even less or maybe a little bit more. But the function trace enables it a lot. Oh, okay. Or not a lot, like, as I said, 100 milliseconds. Okay. Right? And then if the issue hits and cyclic test has an option for that, that um, it stops the tracer. Yeah. So does it record all the time or does the last few seconds? Yes. Yeah, so that's like the bad thing. Okay, I didn't know, yeah, that's a good point. So, uh, so start, that you, start the tracer and then you have trace yeah. command extract, where you will just, after the tracer stopped, extract everything out of it. Okay, so you mean that the trace MB also has uh, similar features like a ring buffer, like it, it will override when, once it's full. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, good point. I'll make a note here. I didn't know that, so it's kind of annoying uh, I, at the beginning when I, you know, watch like uh, there are several gigabytes data. I just take several hours. It hasn't finishing decoding the trace, and uh, so, so that I got a problem like uh, uh, when I decoding using the trace CMD report. I I have to figure out do some uh, simple computation to figure out uh, which core uh, has uh, on which core occurs this high latency. So in my case, is uh, CPU uh, is core sixty three. So I only deco uh, decoded a trace on that CPU. If I, because I'm running uh, 64 cores, if I decode all the trace data from all cores, it's just uh, too slow to decode. Uh, so yeah, if, okay, I, if, if there's a ring buffer, I can just maybe uh, make it easier for decoding. Okay, so this is the, the, the command line for tracing. And uh, this is what I got. Uh, so, uh, because I just traced everything. Uh, uh, so there are just millions of lines in the, uh, in the trace. Uh, so I figure out, but the fortunate thing that I figure out that most of them are just, uh, re uh, just uh, recurring. For example, here. So this is the, uh, the, the piece of uh, event sequence that I repeat over and over again uh, in, the, in the trace. So it's, it, even though you, uh, yeah, for a non-expert or uh, kernel expert, it, it, it is not difficult for me to guess what it means here. Uh, so you just like uh, doing some like uh, go to make the thread go to sleep and doing some context switch and scheduling work from the you know the cyclic test thread to the idle task, and then it wakes up the uh, cyclic test thread and switch uh, schedule back. So in a normal case, so the I mean, with low latency, it just repeats the sequence like this. Uh, and it, then uh, when the breakpoint uh, uh, got hit, so it is over 100 microseconds, it will uh, stop the tracing. And this is the problem uh, uh, sequence. So uh, as a contrast, uh, the, I show the, the screenshot of the problematic trace uh, on the right side. Uh, so, as you can see that uh, when the cyclic test scheduled to the idle task, and then you should switch back to the uh, cyclic, uh, cyclic test, but then somehow it just switched to the idle task again. Uh, so, that's 
that's the difference that I observed by comparing a good sequence and a bad sequence. Um, but there's some still like a little information I can get from the uh, from the uh, sequence, the event sequence. Then I printed the functions. And um, one thing, if you go back, yep, you see cyclic tests on on sketch switch has a D. Yep, which means it got interrupted at some point D and it yep. got blocked on the lock, and this is bad. Okay. So this is like a hint. This should not happen for your RT task. There is another point here is that the cyclic test is not being awakened by an interrupt. It's being awakened on another CPU because you are receiving the rescheduling interrupt. You went for D. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's it. It's not being awakened in the timer. It's being awakened on another CPU, probably because of the D. Yeah. Yeah, and, and the wake up came from another CPU because you don't see the wake up here, you see the rescheduling interrupt. And this, but this could also be, there is one problem with timers that they are not always pinned. It's something that Ana Maria was working and that Red Hat, we have a, a, a hack on the kernel that says that if it's a timer from a real time priority task, they are forcibly pinned to the CPU. It's probably the timer is being awakened on, an, it could be, not sure because of the D, it might, might, it's confusing that D okay. there. <clears throat> no, no, I, I, I see, there is this, but there is also, it could be also the case of the timer, that D could be misinterpreted because of the, no, no, that. Okay, let's see, let's see where he goes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, yes, yeah, you guys are experts, I think, uh, yeah. You can just take me like if I know nothing about the kernel and about the, uh, yes, this uh, real time stuff. And uh, so this is just a step by step how I diagnose the root cause and uh, find out the issue. So, but for here, I still cannot find anything useful. I just see the difference on the, on the events. Then I, I, uh, I read decode the, uh, the trace by printing the functions with the events. So this is the, uh, uh, the the function trace the stack for the uh, for a good latency I mean low latency and uh, in comparison like uh, I list the uh, the problematic uh, 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 function stack trace on the right side so uh, on the top of the diagrams they are just totally exactly the same and uh, uh, highlighted by the right box this is the difference uh, on the on the byte latency. So if you read the uh, read the, the stack, you'll find that the the problem gets from the get random yeah, the get random some U stuff, U32, and then it has uh, a spin log and then it goes to call something called a C uh, uh, the CRNG uh, make state, which is to generate the entropy for the uh, for the uh, for the random for the random number generation. So then the next thing is 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 guys simpler for me. I just uh, to understand what this function does and why it makes a difference here. I just search the kernel code and to figure out uh, what this function does. So I I look up. Uh, for the uh, the CRNG uh, make state uh, function here is something called the, the charge of random uh, number generation. So it's so it actually has a, uh, a different paths here. In a normal case, if the entropy is not a uh, uh, is hasn't run out of entropy, it will just go to the fast path. But if the entropy just run, runs out, and then it will go to the slow path. So then. Yeah, some spin log and some more delay there. So that is why uh, the high latency uh, happens um, on the CPU. So, yep. And I talked this to the kernel engineer. And so the reason that why uh, uh, this is not an issue on, on Intel. Uh, um, so this is from my uh, my colleague because uh, the ARM just used the get random U32 to provide the entropy for the uh, for the system core for the 
uh, stack offset randomization. And but for on x86, uh, it's just the, using the time step to, uh, to get that uh, uh, whatever for the random generation. So, but there's, uh, so based on uh, our, uh, my colleague, the, the kernel engineer, Jeremy Linton, and uh, so they, there's some problem here because it creates some non-deterministic in the system call and uh, when, when the uh, random generation is to be, uh, to regenerate or recede. And uh, we, he also had a hackday patch to, uh, to fix, try to fix the issue to, uh, to use a relatively cheaper, uh, I think, uh, for, uh, to generate the random, I, I think for, for entropy. Uh, so then after I retested the kernel with the patch and so uh, even with the, the randomization kernel stack offset enabled, the max latency is still uh, under eight microseconds. It's, uh, it's eight microseconds, it's, yeah, it's definitely under 10 microseconds. So yeah, that's, that's the showcase for how we uh, debug this large latency on the ARM cores. I, yeah, I guess that's all. I think I still have time for questions. And uh, so let me say this: that um, you did a good job, basically, on f Thank you. finding all the bits together. And what I'm sorry for is that you had to go through all this pain to figure it out, <laughs> out by yourself. Um, it should, I mean, this work should maybe should not go, uh, go to me. I, yeah, it's totally different uh, field uh, than, than, my, uh, than my work. So yeah, but it's fun. I, I would say like debugging this uh, is painful, but it's really, uh, it's really interesting, yeah. So I don't know why Ubuntu did this thing that they did with the RT kernel, uh, but Debian did provide an RT kernel for several re releases by now. And um, I have no idea what Ubuntu does different compared to Debian, but Debian does enables it and keeps it as a showcase. So you usually don't take this kernel and throw it on your RT uh, workload that you have like a real workload because you have a lot of things to tune left and right. Mm -hmm. So this is hardly the case. So you wouldn't usually have like this very long uh, command line because you would um, compile your kernel by yourself regularly because you have your own drivers and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And then you would most likely disable the things that you don't like. Yep. And one thing we could have, and we have this RT wiki where we provide or collect common configuration and steps and what to do. Okay. So maybe we could take some of these things and put it in one spot and maybe Red Hat moves with us in that direction. All of these command lines are also documented on Red Hat tuning guide for real time, and it's open. But then we can copy and paste for the RT week. The Red Hat tuning guide for real time is open. It's not. It's not behind paying more anything. Yeah, I don't mean we have to copy paste. We maybe could uh, reroute those people. As long as you don't have this profile thingy, then it's all good. So the last time I looked at the RT wiki, it says you should use no SMT. Um, and no I don't think you were using that. And then um, the other thing I'm curious, I don't know very much about how this... SMT, you mean uh, the multi-threading? Yeah. Uh, for ARM, we don't have SMT, but uh, for, yes. Okay, so that's not... Yeah, for the Intel, we, we, yeah, we turn off the SMT. Okay, and then um, I, get, I don't know very much about how the stack randomization works, but it, is the stack dynamically getting re-randomized and the entire system has one pool of entropy and it's getting exhausted more with more cores? Is that why more cores created a problem? Because the amount of entropy is sufficient for dynamic randomization with fewer cores? There was a, there was a lot. There was a lock in the call. So more CPUs, more contention on that lock. So, it, so I think what she asks is, is using the same like entropy, like you, we have more cores and then you got faster to, uh, to run out of the entropy. Yeah, but there's also an RT kill. Yeah, so it, it, could, it could be that everybody is hitting that RT spin lock. So yeah, the more CPUs, more contention on the RT spin lock. So what you have there is that, that um, you have a specific number of numbers within an array, which are pre-generated random numbers. And each time you need a random number, you just grab 
U32 from that array. And if that array runs out of numbers, then you need to reseed the numbers and generate more. And this takes time. So there's only one array through the whole system, is that right? There's only one array of random numbers for the whole system. And that's why more cores runs out of, of randomness. Um, I think they are per CPU, but um, the point is you have more cores and more cores need to reseed at the same time. This is synchronized. Regarding hyper-threads, it's not always necessary to disable hyper-threads on Intel. There are Intel CPUs that work fine with hyper-threads, and we are mostly using, we, we do this benchmark with the 10 microseconds. We use with hyper-thread in enable, they work fine. Uh, so my question, actually, before Sebastian interrupts me, uh, regarding, the, regarding the CPUs was not about the load balancing and how the scheduler assigns the tasks or that. I was asking, this looks like big server iron, big arm server iron, right? Yeah. So I was wondering, how are you dispatching the, ta the RT tasks at user space? So we had some customers, for example, who are using big iron and we had to use some Kubernetes magic to load tasks at a certain way. So if you can speak about it, what is your picture on the user space side of things, given uh, the number of cores and so on, the yeah, high number okay. of cores? Uh, I'm not sure if this can answer your question. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I basically uh, understand what you mean. Uh, I mean, so we don't do some specific uh, specifically like a uh, binding or which core on run which workload but we believe that this option like uh, uh, to this affinity to run the cyclic test on core 8 to core 7, 71 and with the 64 threads uh, is that what you're looking for? Yeah that, that's part I understand but I mean from a user space architecture side how do you like dispatch your workload? So his question is because you do isolate CPUs 8 to 71 yes and you throw load on it, the scheduler never puts a task on CPU 8 to 71. So you have to manually assign a task to one of these CPUs in that area, right? Yep. And his question is, how do you manage this assignment? Okay, now you got the answer. Okay. Oh, yeah, I didn't pay, yeah, I, I didn't pay uh, much attention on this. I, 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 I thought that a cyclic test just automatically bind I, one. I think, I think I can answer him. I think I can answer him. He okay, is thank doing, you. <laughs> he's doing an experiment that is a standard for the people doing 5G. So the people doing 5G, they have this. They would like to have a CPU isolated, and they try to achieve this 10 microseconds because that's how the competitors compete. If they can reach the 10 microseconds, it's good. If it, otherwise, no. But the people that will run the workload here, he's not trying that. He's just running the benchmark to see if it's good or bad. And then and the it, people that yes. run the, these two is generally people doing NFV, Network Function Virtualization, and the PDK. They run busy loop tasks, and they, they are aware of affinity. Yeah. I'm not sure task set is related to this. We usually, like, you want to bind your workload to specific cores, you can... But, but yeah, like, but how you can guarantee that the CPU uh, load those workloads uh, evenly, or I mean, uh, binancely, but, I, yeah. For that question, I have no answer for that. Yeah. Um, he wasn't trying that. Yeah. Um, one thing, um, you run no hertz full as far as, I'm, as I've seen. Um, if you will do for periodic, you could have lower latencies, but then um, for no hertz full, the latency is lower if you remain in user land all the time. Right? Yeah, yeah but probably they reach, he's using that option because people on the field of 5G use that option because the people on the DPDK network function virtualization have the tools that only run in user space. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. That's okay. the, the, use, the people that will run on top of this setup needs no hertz full because it's just a busy loop in user space collecting data from network. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're running out of time. That's why roughly it yeah. works fine. Yeah, thanks for your input and a really good discussion. And also, like, uh, yeah, ARM is very actively working on 
com collaborating with uh, partners. So if you have any uh, interest in running your workload on ARM cores, but yeah, don't hesitate to reach out to us. So we're really interested in looking at that. And uh, also, I really feel ARM should hire your guys. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thanks for your input and help. Thank you.